welcome to this night's living room from Chicago. My name is Kim Parham, and on behalf of the Bonnie Adario Lung Cancer Foundation, I would like to welcome you in the room, our panelists, and everyone online. Danielle and Bonnie are not able to be with us, so it's Michelle and I here tonight with all of you all. And thank you for coming out on this cold night here in Chicago. And it is the start of November, Lung Cancer Awareness Month, and we're having um, a really good campaign recognizing thrivers and survivors this month. So please log in, share stories, read stories, and get inspired. And now I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves, and the topic today is on uh, treating lung cancer today. So I'm Jessica Donington. I'm the new chief of thoracic surgery at the University of Chicago. Uh, obviously, I'm a surgeon. I treat a lot of people with early stage disease, uh, but the extent of surgical resection is reaching further and further out into all stages of lung cancer. Um, and what's going on mostly that's hot and new today that we can talk about a little bit are just smaller and smaller incisions, less invasive surgery, trying to make surgery part of multidisciplinary care. It's not just that you get one, one type of treatment, but you're going to get all kinds of treatment. My name is Kyle Hogarth. I'm a pulmonologist and a bronchoscopist. I'm fortunate enough to have uh, colleagues who I work closely with uh, in the field of bronchoscopy uh, and pulmonary, uh, obviously focused on lung cancer, both with early detection uh, with our lung cancer screening program and then also uh, early diagnosis in regards to the ability to biopsy small nodules and then appropriately stage patients if that's also necessary uh, with minimally invasive techniques and um, I'm fortunate enough to also be working with the people you see up here on the stage and amongst many others who are not here um, it's uh, you know if ever there's a disease that requires a team it's definitively this one and so um, I'm glad to be here. I'm Jyothi Patel. I'm the Director of Thoracic Oncology at the University of Chicago, and I'm thrilled for you to be here um, and to talk a, a little bit about um, why I do this and what's really exciting and what I'm most excited about in the next decades. Um, it has been a dizzying time in lung cancer. Certainly, I never thought that I would be a lung cancer oncologist when I um, started medical school, um, but I very quickly got hooked on the science and discovery and very quickly realized in, uh, in some fa the first phase one patient I met, which at the time phase one meant early drugs that um, were unlikely to work and given to patients who had exhausted treatment options. It was a different paradigm back then. But I was in clinic with a w wonderful um, oncologist, Mark Chris, and we were treating a patient who'd been, uh, who'd undergone multiple treatments, and he was like, Look, we're gonna try this pill. And I was like, this pill? This pill, this drug Jafitna, Bururessa. And this woman, after, even though she'd had multiple therapies and was profoundly symptomatic, had disease response within days. And at that moment, sort of seeing where the science could go and really seeing the impact we could have patient, on patients, came clear that I was going to become a thoracic oncologist. And that's really the beginning of what has been almost two decades of constant progress. It's amazing to think about how we approach lung cancer now. Almost every patient I meet with advanced disease is treated differently than I would have treated them five or six years ago. It's a tremendous pace of discovery. There's much work to be done, but it's really something that is done in partnership with great teams. Um, because patients have multiple needs, because we're learning more about how to get information about the patient and tumors, um, it's a team sport and it requires good communication. It requires sort of that 360 view of not only what's happening in front of us, but the idea of what could happen and how, when do we push and when do we think about decreasing um, certain um, interventions to decrease toxicities and to improve quality of life. And there are other times when we're sort of all in um, asking for things that would have sounded dramatic a decade ago, like resection or higher doses of radiation or more tissue to understand fundamental questions. So thank you. 
my name is Livia. I am one of the um, one of the fourth nurses in um, Chess Oncology. Um, the other two Kellys won't, won't be able, like not able to be uh, joining us here. So I've been an oncology nurse like, since '87. So I started off with working inpatient hemonc floor, working with a neck cancer patient from '87 to '97. Um, I joined the lung cancer group because like my older one started kindergarten and he I worked 12 hour shift he said I never home so <laughs> I quit my job and I came I came actually went to interview an infusion center and Dr. Hoffman and Sylvia Watson kind of detoured me my interview so like they were like they both were saying that you are not going to work in over infusion center we need a we need a nurse in the lung cancer group and that's that's how I joined them, and ever since I since '97, <coughs> and I was really devastated when I had to leave the head and neck uh, patient populations. I thought that was my love, and then shortly after I joined the lung cancer team, I think that I found my passion. I think lung cancer is my is my passion. It's definitely I would never change anything else. <laughs> Let's back that up to early detection now. So who can qualify for screening and how are you detecting cancer earlier to have the genomic testing appropriate and possible surgery, radiation? Just kind of walk us through how that would happen. Why don't you fire it off? So I'll start with screening. So the first trial that uh, finally found a benefit to CT screening for lung cancer just came out about five years ago. I don't want to say it was ignored. It wasn't ignored. It's been slowly adopted and slowly integrated. And it showed that if we took high-risk individuals, which may not have been any of you in the room, unfortunately, but people who are over the age of 55, who had smoked for more than 30 years, who had quit relatively recently if you weren't still smoking, that those patients, if they underwent a CT scan, once and then possibly yearly had a decreased risk of dying from lung cancer. That was a great trial. It was one here in the United States. It took like 20 years to do it, and it was the National Lung Screening Trial. This past year, the second positive trial uh, came out uh, when we were all in Toronto at the World Conference for Lung Cancer. It was run in the Netherlands. It was called the Nelson Trial, and it showed even a greater reduction in deaths from lung cancer related to CT screening. So we are kind of at this point where this is becoming an imperative in our country to make CT screening for lung cancer exactly like mammography and colonoscopy and a yearly PSA. It's just something we have to do in those individuals who smoke. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking for that next detection uh, technique that will help fight, you know, find it for everybody, but in those high-risk populations, this is really essential. And it's essential that we have patients asking, or not even patients yet, having individuals who have smoked asking and talking to their doctors about this. It's really important. Yeah. What do you think about, um, so what do you, where do things stand with screening for people who have an extensive family history of the disease? That's always been really hard because we know that there is a genetic link to lung cancer. For a while, it was really hard to tease out like the genetics of lung cancer from people who smoke in packs, but there's clearly you know, a genetic basis to lung cancer. I think it's gonna be a while before we can convince insurance companies to pay for that. At the same time, do I not think that this is still, if you have a family history of lung cancer, something you could discuss with your doctors? I absolutely think it is. Um, because I know that there are people who, who don't quite fit in the box of what is currently recommended um, by our government for who should be screened, but who should still be having that active conversation with their physicians. Yeah, the American College of Chest Physicians guidelines on lung cancer screening, and there's multiple different recommendations that are all within the U.S. pretty similar with subtle differences. But one of the caveats they put out recently was to try to address questions like that and said, um, though there's not strong enough evidence to say this is a general recommendation, um, clearly in the end all guidelines are just that. They are guidance, they are a starting point, but an individual's discussion with their physician and the pro-cons to obtaining CT screening 
should always be entertained and should always be discussed. You know, there, there can be obviously financial ramifications for ordering a CT scan that's not going to be covered by an insurance company. It can be a very significant out-of-pocket cost uh, for an individual. Um, there are ways to help fight that, but it's um, the eternal struggle sometimes. And I'd add that I think things are changing quickly. So yes. as we're getting more germline um, information, so that means in not cancerous genetic information, but um, but inherited genetic information, we're starting to understand susceptibility. We'll be cataloging this over time. And so what we know today necessarily is not going to apply in 10 years. Our technology for CT scanning is improving significantly. The dose of radiation, which was always our worry, in young and healthy individuals continues to decrease phenomenally. We have better predictors based on radiomics about what a cancer could look like because that's really the issue is we don't want a bunch of false positives or CT scans that look suspicious in which we do invasive testing which could hurt someone and that's why we don't do CT scanning more frequently. Um, but so that there's a learning curve and we're getting there but it really does take attention to collecting tissue collecting blood from healthy volunteers and so that's a big effort in Chicago the all of us initiative I think is really looking at a diverse group of individuals to provide um, serial uh, biologic specimens and to follow for um, for interceding illness and disease okay so if you have a CT screening or an image possibly done as a pre-op or um, gallbladder and they see a nodule, how do you determine the appropriate surveillance of those nodules? What helps guide you? So similar to what we've talked about before, there are now are guidelines that allow us to look at a nodule and then also look at the individual it's in look at the risk for, you know, what, how likely is this to be a cancer based on the individual, and then what does the nodule look like. And that guides us as to who needs a biopsy, who needs to be re-imaged in a couple weeks versus who needs to be re-imaged in a couple months or who needs to be re-imaged in a year, or maybe never. I always tell my patients now that, you know, we have such good CT scans, we see everything in people's lungs and as we get older our lungs are like our skin they're not perfect anymore there are freckles there are moles there are wrinkles <laughs> there's all these things and luckily we have really good chest radiologists who are good at kind of reading that map and letting us know which ones uh, need attention and which don't yeah the the approach to a nodule is is are there things about it that make me more worried it's cancerous or a lot less worried it's cancerous and that's what helps then guide the recommendation to watch and wait and following some of the guidelines on that. Because and it starts with size. Larger the nodule, the more concerning it is. Also shape and characteristics of it. And all these are part of the radiology. Um, and so things that are less worrisome from a cancer perspective. Notice we don't say zero risk. But those are the things that what we're trying desperately to do is to avoid unnecessary invasive procedures because each of those carry a risk. And so something is potentially low risk <coughs> we're going to offer a, re a repeat imaging to see if there's been any change in characteristics of the nodule to help try to avoid unnecessary bronchoscopies and surgeries and needle biopsies, et cetera. But paying attention to the follow-up, because if it changes, it still doesn't necessarily mean it's cancer, but now the risk has gone up. And now the risk of any form of an invasive procedure is worth it, because now we need to know the nodule has shifted. Talk to us about who all should be on your multidisciplinary team? How often do you meet? Who all is in the room? And their roles. I think this is only half, like this is what, um, a tenth of the group. So you, we usually have like every Wednesday morning, we usually have approximately like 25 to 30 people. So thoracic surgery, uh, surgery team, like a surgeon, thoracic um, PA, and pulmonary uh, medicine, they have their, their physicians, fellow nurses, MP, and uh, um, the pathology team, they have their pathologists and their fellows, and radiologists, they have like, attending and, and a resident, and then our medical oncology team, um, physicians, fellows, and nurses, and data manager and data coordinator. 
So and it's a huge, well. and radiation oncology, I'm so sorry. They will be so mad at us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's their group too, so it's approximately usually like four to five uh, of them. So it is a huge group. And recently we've been having a very short of tears and we are like stand, yeah. stand room only. So we will be having that tomorrow morning. So yeah. for, the, for the people that are online, if your lung cancer diagnosis is not being managed at a place that has a multidisciplinary tumor board that doesn't meet regular, then pack your bags and go someplace else. <laughs> because think about this. Why in the world would you individually go see each of us? That's already gonna take too long on your cancer journey. When through a meeting where all of us are present, we can right up front determine that, okay, testing and, bi and biopsies and everything, and fortunately proven stage four. Well, you don't need to come see me or her. Go straight to medical oncology. So, and it's, it's amazing how often this happens. Well, people will get sent to me, or I know happens to thoracic uh, surgery all the time. Someone who will not benefit from thoracic surgery arrives in her office. Well, now we've just wasted some time. Now, luckily at our place, we'll quickly get you right where you belong, but that's all taken care of when you have all the people that are interested in your outcome in one room at the same time. Even people that you've never met because they're weighing in. The radiologist who you've never met is the one who's reading your scan and comparing it to before and helping to determine whether things have improved or not. That's gonna help guide other management decisions. Maybe they do need more tissue. Oh, look how much things have shrunk. It's time for surgery now, you know, et cetera. Now you're getting the advantage of all these brilliant minds in one room at the same time, only focused on you. And I think it's actually fewer and fewer patients who need one of us. Right. You know, right. Um, <laughs> you know uh, yeah, systemic therapies <laughs> are, are moving earlier and earlier because cure rates for stage one are not 100 percent. Right. So clearly we need more chemo or radiation kind of to go along with surgery. And then local therapies, radiation and surgery are moving into later stage diseases as we have, you know, chemos and immunotherapies that work so well. We now have people who have had one little nodule for five years. Let's get rid of it. Um, so I think, yeah, and the, the continuous and never ending need for tissue is, is, yeah. is uh, you know, drives this all back to that group too. So I do agree that you really need to be part of a group because it takes a village now, it really does. So I think there are two parts to it. One, I think what we described was the mythical tumor board. So tumor board means all of us sitting around a table going through cases, looking at the um, images, talking about approach to it and pathology. In addition to that, we have a couple of other meetings that I think are important. One is um, all of us come together for a research meeting. So we present to each other. Like when, I, when, we, when the new toy shows up, <laughs> we all want to hear about it. When there's a new clinical trial that we're starting, when there's a new intervention, we present to each other and keep each other informed. So that's a, 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 an event that happens frequently. We also have a weekly meeting for all of our patients on clinical trials where we together, it's called the Deity Safety Monitoring Board, the DSMB, where we go through each patient and talk about toxicities and how they're doing and what we know about um, the trial or if there are any um, changes or amendments in that trial. And so that's kind of our piece. But the multidisciplinary team goes beyond that as well for a patient. So we do a clinic wrap-up in medical oncology at the end of the week where we include our palliative care physicians, our social workers. Many oncology clinics now have embedded um, support, uh, supportive oncology centers that include nutritionists, physical therapists, social workers, psychologists. When you're spending, hopefully, years in the getting therapy over time, needs change, right? There may be times where you're having more toxicity from therapy, where you do need attention to symptoms. There might be times in which there's less involvement, in which things are going well, and you have a clear pathway to that next appointment in several months. And so it's important to establish that whole team when you first meet, although it sounds overwhelming when we say, oh, we want to introduce you to palliative care, we want you to meet you know, the four people that uh, may be thinking about you. You're not going to see all of those people all of the time, but it's important to understand that you've got this entire universe of people that are, are watching and there to help you. Michelle, anybody online with any comments? Or questions? Um, so someone's asking, should my kids get checked for lung cancer because their mother has EGFR adenocarcinoma? I would say currently, 
Okay. Should your children get checked for lung cancer if they have EGFR mutation? If only if one person. If the one person of the lung, correct. So I think the weight of the evidence suggests that probably a single case doesn't warrant a really investigation into family history. There are some families in which multiple members have lung cancer and we can see similar mutations within generations or between sisters or, or cousins. And for those, as Dr. Donington was saying, having a detailed discussion about other risk factors and um, and resources that are available might guide sort of a baseline scan and, and testing with the idea that if your children are young, we're looking at decades of, of some kind of surveillance and that science will catch up. Um, so right now we say usually if there's a single case, no, but, but that's a really soft no. I mean, right. The world is changing right. and what we're able to do is changing. How we're able to detect cancers is changing.